and back of the other. But if you look at the back of the eye that seems normal on the front, that's abnormal as well. But this is a case that we saw who has obviously an abnormal eye here. If we look at the other eye, we can see here their K-max is about 66 diopters in curvature. And uh, their aspericity value is prolate at 1.25, so an E value of plus 1.25. And we can see the location of the maximum elevation on the front and back, and the thin point, how they agree, as I've been showing you. But there's their other eye. Now, one might argue, ooh, it's a little bit steeper down here. But believe me, if I didn't see anything, I would consider that normal. Surely the elevation is blatantly normal. There's nothing abnormal. And the pachymetry, in terms of both the magnitude of the thinnest point and its location, is perfectly normal. So this is the other eye. I consider this, at least with this technology to be a unilateral case. We've been following this patient. They've had no progression. So uh, that's probably the steepest cone or the most elevated cone I've ever treated. Um, that's a cone, right? So I don't know. I forgot to go ahead and measure this for you, but it, it's pretty deep. So this is a guy who was, uh, came in after going God knows how many other places and said, everybody wants to do a transplant. I don't want to do a transplant. I said, well, I probably look at you and say, do a transplant but you absolutely don't want to do a transplant. We ended up fitting him with you know, a large diameter, 18 millimeter scleral lens. We were able to actually fit this guy, and he was able to get 24 days plus acuity in that eye. The other eye was a little less involved, and he was somewhere between 25th and 30th, and he's been happy ever after. But if we look at the actual um, format refractive, pretty amazing stuff. The steepest part of his cornea, 103 diopters of curvature, and the thinnest part is 93 microns. So we didn't even speak loudly in front of his eye. <laughs> but uh, it's a pretty wild case. Uh, corneal reshaping pre and post, typically we're going to look at our axial map for curvature. But if we really want to locate where the center of our treatment is, we'll go to a more detailed tangential map, same patient. Or we can look at refractive power on the front of the uh, surface of the cornea. So we do a lot of corneal reshaping at the practice. And these are the kinds of comparatives that we do typically. Here's a case talking about comparative. Thickness compared. The patient was in about a week and a half ago. We did cataract surgery on him. He came back and saw me, you know, on day one and said, you know, I know I'm not supposed to see gray, but I'm seeing hazy out of my eyes. Something seems wrong. Um, we refracted him to 2020, but he said it was hazy. We ran an OCT of the macula. It was absolutely perfect. No concern. Maybe he's got some macula edema. Well, we looked very carefully at the cornea and kind of get a feeling that maybe there's just a little diffuse haziness. So we ran the Penicam, and we can see his pre-op and his post-op global thickness. He had an increase in thickness close to 100 microns. So he had diffuse edema. Now, you know, we put him on some more hypertonics. He stayed on his steroids and his antibiotics, and within the next five days, he cleared up perfectly. So we see that, again, not commonly, but surely not unheard of in post-operative uh, cataract surgery that gets some diffuse edema that'll just be transient and go away. But he was very concerned. He thought something happened to him, got the bit inside his eye or had an infection or whatever. And here we said, no, it's just a little bit of thickening of the cornea. It's going to be transient. You're going to be fine. And lo and behold, it was fine. Here's a case that we ended up doing the PI on very narrow chamber, anteriorly displaced uh, iris, as you can see here. And those values are pretty concerning in terms of the depth of the anterior chamber and the uh, angle. And here we see case of form fruits keratoconus. You can see within the pupil zone here, pretty normal on that front. Whenever I see a patient with keratoconus who within the pupillary area looks quite regular, 90 degree separation of tericity, you know, the edge of the actual cone not coming up there, I know I should be able to refract that patient quite well. I already know in my mind what I expect to get visually assuming they don't have a retina problem or a cataract. And so this patient was absolutely normally refracted to 2020, even though posterior elevation and pachymetric progression were not normal. The other eye, a little bit more involved. You can see the posterior elevation more uh, hot and the anterior starting to show. And even here, more irregularity within the pupil zone. This was like a 25th minus 2030 best corrected spectacle case. But we've been following this uh, woman for probably about eight or nine years with absolutely no progression. So, you know, we don't have time to talk about when to cross-link, when not to cross-link. That's a really interesting conversation. You know, just because you have keratoconus doesn't mean you have cross-linking done. Uh, but certain forms you really should. So it just takes a lot more conversation. This is a case of high drops that came in. We can see that's pretty thick, right? Right in there. And actually thinned out here inferiorly. And look at that 
uh, reflection in the dead cytometry. If we look at the thickness profile map, it's very thin down here, but amazingly thick up into the upper 700s as you get to that thickest part of that hydrops eye. Well, we treated her and monitored her, and here now about another week or two later, that's a scar, by the way, uh, it went back down to sort of its normal, uh, its normal corneal thickness. Now we repeat it, and we get, oh, look, now it looks more like a keratoconic uh, pachymetry map. You get that very thin cornea. The numbers are in the 300s here, 400s here, and we created a difference map between while in high drops, while not. This, I think, might have been an anomaly here, and that's why it looks like it thickened up. Um, I don't know if that was an optical anomaly, but surely within the pupillary zone, you can see the dramatic difference that occurs there. Here's just some, not really critical to use a pedicam, but we just wanted it to show you about the imaging of subepithelial infiltrates in an EKC case that we saw there. Here's a post intact that you can see very, very nicely. Here's one I do want to share with you in the last moments uh, before we kind of finish up here, and that's in PMD. I think pellucid marginal degeneration is probably one of the most incorrectly and overdiagnosed conditions in ectasia that's out there. I can guarantee you that probably 95% of the cases you see you think are PMD are keratoconus and not PMD. Let me show you the difference. What is PMD? It's a rare condition where the cornea has a linear band of thinning, generally about a millimeter to two from the inferior limbus. You can see that here in this particular image. And when you run a global pachymetry map, from Pentacam, you can see that inferior thinning area right there. And here's a classic case and a little bit better um, description and image for you. You can see that band of thinning right here, and you can see that thinning here. However, this is what I see all the time. You see these curvature maps that look that classic kissing dove or whatever term you want to use for it, where you have that your curvature steepening here, that high against the rule of stigmatism. If all you had was a placido topographer, you would say this person has PMD, okay? But just look at the elevation map. That's not classic of PMD. That looks like keratoconus. And look at the thickness map. Where's the thinnest point? The thinnest point is here, coincident with that area here. It's not down here. Here it thickens up again. That's keratoconus with a curvature map that creates a pseudo PMD. And I will tell you, the vast majority of them, because I see them all the time, are these cases, not true PMD. So let's summarize. What are the advantages of this technology? It's a diversity of clinical applications, as I've suggested. There's way more that I haven't shown you. The ability to analyze that posterior cornea is critical. It's very accurate, reproducible. Um, it's got expanding software all the time, and it's quite robust. Uh, very easy techs run these for us. And what's most important, Patients like it, it's very easy to run, and it's networkable. So in our practice, most all of our instruments are this way, but this one for sure is networked so that the techs run it, but the doctors open it up in the exam rooms, and through their software can manipulate the data as if we were standing in front of the pentacam. It's not like you just see this image, and that's all there is. We can do all kinds of analysis, change things, and look at it in different ways from the exam room. So how do you bill for it, right? Uh, this is where it gets a little shady, and I'm not telling you to do this. I'm just saying these are some thoughts that I've heard out there. Of course, you can bill it as corneal topography if you have the right diagnosis code. And in 2012, we get to 40 some odd dollars for Blue Cross Blue Shield. Pachymetry is a question mark because the definition of your 7.6 pachymetry is that it's ultrasonic. This is obviously not ultras ultrasonic. You can use a 92499 code, unlisted ophthalmic procedure, um, but the ultrasonic you know, generally reimburses just about $17. Um, and again, can only be done once in a lifetime for a patient for glaucoma, but if you have certain corneal conditions like keratoconus, like Fuchs dystrophy, even glutata, endothelial disease, you can do that once a year. Some of the uh, insurance companies will, uh, if you have a diagnosis of edema, let you do it much more frequently as well and bill for that. Of course, these are anterior segment external images, 92285, unquestionably and they meet the criterion of helping you diagnose and manage and look for change over time. So this is a no-brainer. So we use this code, we use this code occasionally. Here's a question mark. You know, gonioscopy theoretically is putting a lens on the eye. You know, I know people who utilize the regular gonioscopy code with Pentacam and with anterior segment OCT and others, um, but that's surely a question mark. And we also utilize it as part of our contact lens diagnostic evaluation Patients with contact lens where they get a pentacam every single year, okay? We are looking at the shape of their cornea. Now, that's not billable to insurance, typically. That's part of their out-of-pocket contact lens diagnostic uh, procedure fee. 
that they get at the office. So I hope I was able to enlighten you a little bit and kind of give you a little feeling about the uh, technology. And I'll hang out for a couple of questions if you want, but I thank you very much for your attention.